Hi, good evening, everyone. I, I'm really excited to be here tonight. Um, so I'm especially excited about tonight's program um, because I have read Dr. Well, let me let me introduce him and we'll start there. Uh, Dr. Gregory Derry is Professor Emeritus of Physics at Loyola University in Maryland. He holds a BS from Uni Union College and a PhD from Pennsylvania State University, both in physics. His research specialties have included experimental ultra-high vacuum surface physics, nonlinear dynamical studies of physiological systems, and epistemological issues in the science-religion relationship. So he's, he's right up our alley. He has also had a strong interest in improving the science education of students who are not majoring in the sciences. He's published 33 peer-reviewed articles and two books, What Science Is and How It Works, and The Only Sacred Ground, Scientific Materialism and a Sacred View of Nature Within the Framework of Complementarity. And that is why I'm excited. Complementarity is one of my favorite topics from, uh, from the world of quantum physics. And um, I'm especially interested, and I think maybe some of you either are or will soon be, interested in how the idea of complementarity might be applied in other realms, like maybe religion. So without further ado, oh, but let me remind you again, um, you can ask questions at any time, put them in using the Q&A button at the bottom of your, your Zoom window, uh, but don't use the chat, the chat's been disabled. All right, so go ahead and ask those questions at any time. And without any further words from me, let me introduce Dr. Gregory Derry. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, that introduction, JD. And thank you to all of the people who have joined us for this um, uh, discussion of, of alternate uh, ways of, uh, of um, reality. So uh, let me try sharing my screen. We uh, will get going here. So I want to start with a, um, a kind of visual metaphor for the sorts of problems that we're going to be talking about. And so what, what you're seeing here are a set of images. And across the top, this is a uh, diffraction um, uh, image from a, from a crystal. This is a tokamak, which is a technological device that recreates the fusion in the sun. And this is a, a diagram of a chlorophyll molecule. And if you now look at the, um, the images below that, I think you can probably see where I'm going with this. Okay, this is a diffraction pattern from a crystal. This is an actual crystal. And this is uh, the fusion reactions in the sun technologically created. And this is a, uh, an actual encounter with a beautiful sunrise. And this is a chlorophyll molecule diagram, but this is some living leaves that, that we can encounter in nature. And I, I'm gonna have a kind of shorthand vocabulary for these things. I'm gonna call the sorts of encounters with nature that we have in this fashion, a mundane world. And I'm gonna call these sorts of things a sacred world. And the next couple of slides will give you a more uh, precise definition of what I mean by these things. So um, when I talk about the mundane world, what I'm actually talking about is uh, an ideology, a philosophy called scientific materialism. And the, the main point of this is that it claims that there's nothing except matter and energy. Those are the only things that exist. The scientific part is that the matter and energy uh, are governed by, uh, by, by lawful regularities. And um, what's, what's left out, which, which doesn't exist according to this, are things like life, consciousness, emotions, any kind of uh, supernatural order of being, anything that's not matter and energy is, is, is simply non-existent. Uh, and uh, this quotation from from Vitsum sort of sort of puts it puts it right here. There there are no gaps or breaks. There's, there's nothing else. There there's just matter and energy. And um, 
And in contrast to the mundane world, there, there's another way of apprehending reality. And, and that's what I'm gonna be calling uh, a sacred world where, where, where meaning does exist. And a, a definition of the sacred uh, isn't as simple as a definition of scientific materialism. There's no one sentence I can describe it in. But if you look at these sacred literatures, uh, what, what people who have experienced these things have written, you, you notice a, um, a, a recurring set of themes that, that we can use to, um, to get a sense of what we mean by the sacred. And these themes include aliveness, uh, meaning, uh, a sense of interconnectedness and um, an awareness of, of a presence, a, a divine presence, if you want to say it that way. And um, since I'm not particularly poetic, I've got a set of quotations here that you can scan, which give you uh, perhaps a, a better sense of what we're talking about. So, um, so this sacred world I'm talking about in this mundane world, these two ways of apprehending reality are uh, basically, if you've been looking at what we've been saying, that they're, they're mutually exclusive. Uh, it seems as though you can believe one, but that excludes belief in the other. And um, what I'm going to claim is that that's not quite so. And, and uh, as JD said, I'm going to use uh, this idea of complementarity to do that. So simply put, uh, complementarity is a, a, it's a logic term, it's a logical framework in which two mutually exclusive propositions are both true, rather than, than the proposition being true, and if it's true, it's not false and vice versa. Uh, two propositions can both be true at the same time, even though they're mutually exclusive. And this is a, it, it goes back to Aristotle, uh, it was discussed in, in the Middle Ages, it's not a new thing. And it has actually been used in science religion for, for some decades now. And down at the bottom, I have a quote from Don McKay, this is taken from an article he wrote in Zygon in the mid 1970s where he uh, says that complementarity is, is, is necessary for science religion issues. Uh, but there is a second more specific um, sense of, of the word complementarity, and, and that's the, um, the framework that Niels Bohr developed as epistemological analysis of paradoxical results in quantum theory and uh, Bohr's analysis adds some interesting um, new capabilities to the use of complementarity. So uh, I'll be focusing on that. So um, with complementarity, I'm going to be claiming that the uh, proposition that nature is sacred is true. And the proposition that nature is mundane is true. These, these things are, are, are both equally valid propositions and, um, and how that can be is what we're going to be exploring over the next few minutes. So I'm going to use uh, Bohr's complementarity because of the, uh, the added uh, power it will give our analysis. It, it allows us to develop a, an analytical methodology. But um, Bohr's reasoning was developed for the empirical sciences, for quantum theory in particular. And although Bohr expanded it to other sciences, um, uh, it's not obvious that that it can be used for science religion issues. In fact, um, Ian Barber in his um, authoritative book back in the 1990s, uh, attacked the use of Bohr's uh, complementarity for science religion issues, just for that reason, uh, arguing that it was a, um, a, a category error, that, that uh, it, it, you were using it in a place where it didn't count. 
And I think he had a point there uh, that I, I was, I was um, uh, convinced by his argument. And so what I'll be doing here is trying to broaden the terms and, and come up with an argument for complementarity that is applicable to the uh, science religion issues. Um, and that is, is basically um, similar in, 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 its, um, in its argument to the one that Bohr made for complementarity in quantum theory. So that's where I'm going to be going. And we'll start with the problem that Bohr himself was working on, which are these issues in quantum theory. Now, um, we, we don't need to talk about all these issues that would take a long time. So I'll just focus on one that will tell us everything we, we need to know, and that's wave particle duality. Uh, you're probably familiar with that already. It's pretty well known. Uh, and um, just briefly, we can see it over on this uh, over the, on this image, where these vertical bars are are wave interference effects. They are there due to wave interference. So what's creating them would be a wave. But notice that the pattern is built up by these individual little dots, and these individual little dots are particles hitting the screen. So just in this one experiment here, you can see wave particle duality in action. You can't explain it without it being a wave, but you can't explain it without being a particle either. So those sorts of paradoxical results were the kinds of things that Bohr was working on. And Bohr uh, first became famous when he was young and developed his quantized hydrogen atom model in 1913 seen on that, that, that Danish postage stamp. But um, as he uh, went through the next couple of decades during the development of quantum theory to its final fruition, he realized that, that uh, a deeper analysis was required to, to uh, attack these problems. And unlike many of his colleagues who were interested only in a better mathematical formalism, Bohr thought that uh, epistemology was going to be important, that, that there were, were philosophical issues that needed to be addressed. And so uh, let's take a close look at Bohr's argument for complementarity. He starts out with what he referred to as the quantum postulate, which is basically uh, the fact that there are intrinsic discontinuities at a microscopic level. And those are uh, epitomized by, by Planck's constant, which is a fundamental constant of nature. If it were zero, we would have full continuity everywhere. But uh, because it's not zero, we have just intrinsic discontinuities. Now that's basically a contingent physical fact. The second premise he makes is an epistemological argument, however. It's not physical, it's philosophical. And it's the idea that if, if a system is an isolated system, if you're not interacting with it in any way, you can't be getting any information from it. So in essence, it's a, it says we can't know anything about an isolated system. We need to interact with it. But now if we're interacting, we're interacting in the presence of these intrinsic discontinuities that, 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 um, that are problematic. And, and so you can't talk about just some physical system. You've got to have the system and the apparatus that's interacting with it. And Bohr's term for that was undivided wholeness, that the system and the apparatus come as a single package that you can't divide them into two. And because of that, any knowledge you acquire is conditioned by the experiment, right? So the experimental conditions, the apparatus, the way you've arranged it, that's going to determine what kind of knowledge you can get. 
Now, um, because we need to use what Bohr produced classical concepts, basically the way we usually think about things, uh, we have to do that because we live in a macroscopic world where our perceptions are conditioned that way. Uh, then it turns out that the experimental conditions for space-time coordination are, are mutually exclusive to the conditions for what Bohr called the claim of causality, which is basically dynamic regularity, conservation laws, that kind of thing. And, and that's the complementarity that Bohr was talking about. Uh, you can have space-time coordination or you can have dynamical regularity, the claim of causality. You can't have both at the same time. They're, mute, they're, they're found under mutually exclusive conditions. So they're mutually exclusive kinds of knowledge. In other words, complementary possibilities. Bohr's use of the word complementarity is basically his shorthand for this entire argument. Okay, so that's how we can talk about complementarity in quantum theory. What's that got to do with the sacred? And this is my generalization of Bohr's argument to try to tackle this mundane sacred uh, dichotomy. So um, I'm starting also with no knowledge of isolated systems, but now we're not talking about an apparatus. We're talking about a human, a knowing subject. And so the presence of a knowing subject is required for there to be knowledge. We have to interact with our environment and and so we now have the subject object relationship. And that relationship is a relationship also of undivided wholeness, okay? So it's very analogous to what Bohr was talking about with physical systems and experiments. But now we're talking about a knowing subject and that, that puts us into a much different, different uh, category. But the, the, the um, upshot of it is really pretty analogous because in the same way that the way you arrange the apparatus determines whether you see a wave or see a particle, what we're going to experience in this subject-object relationship is going to be conditioned by the by what state we're in, the conditions under which the knowledge is acquired. Okay, so those kinds of conditions are how our brains are wired, how we perceive the world, uh, our cultures, our language, our state of consciousness. All of that is going to determine what the world is to us, how we apprehend the world. Okay, and what I'm going to be claiming is that the uh, conditions to perceive a mundane world and the conditions for the apprehension of a sacred aspect of nature, I'm going to claim those are mutually exclusive conditions, which is how complementarity can be applied to, to the, um, the problem that we're trying to solve here. Okay, so the last two slides have been pretty complicated and I went over them pretty quickly. So, so let's just focus on the bottom line here. The key point is that the knowledge we acquire from the world is dependent on the conditions under which the knowledge is acquired. And the reason I think that's important is because it now opens the possibility to use this complementarity idea as a methodology to analyze particular cases. And I think what you may be wondering at this point is what do I really mean by the conditions under which knowledge is acquired? That's a very vague sounding term. I gave you some generic idea of it, but 
But I think at this point, what will be useful are a number of particular examples to see what, what we really mean by that and how this plays out in, in particular situations. So uh, the first three are simple, um, simple situations just to get a flavor for what we mean by the conditions under which knowledge is acquired and how that can be either sacred or mundane. Uh, the fourth one is a much more extended, uh, complicated problem, which is uh, a long running problem in science religion issues. And we'll see what complementarity can do to help us look at that problem. But, but first we'll do a couple of simple ones to uh, warm up for that. So um, that's an image of uh, Mount Fuji and it, um, it's sacred to, to um, well, D.T. Suzuki in this quotation, for example, but how would we approach it in a mundane world? Well, it's just a geological formation, right? So we would talk about it in terms of plate tectonics, uh, meteorological phenomena. If we, if we go to higher elevations, the temperature will get, will get lower. Uh, we'll, the water will turn to ice at some point uh, and so forth and so on. So what are the conditions under which we're gaining that knowledge of Mount Fuji. Uh, well, we're using instrumentation, we're uh, creating uh, models, plate tectonics is basically a model of how the earth is working. Uh, we would solve some thermodynamic equations for the meteorological phenomena. Um, those are the conditions under which that sort of mundane knowledge would be acquired. And I think we'll all agree that's perfectly valid knowledge that's, that tells us all about Mount Fuji. But of course, it doesn't tell us all about Mount Fuji, does it? Because um, if you look at uh, the quote from, from Suzuki, uh, he talks about uh, highly spiritual intuition, Fuji seen as rising from the background of emptiness. That's a very different apprehension of that mountain than we got from geology and meteorology. And what are the conditions under which D.T. Suzuki is acquiring his knowledge that he, that he gives us in this quotation? Well, the conditions under which he's acquiring that knowledge are the conditions of the mind of, of, of a Zen practitioner with, with many decades of, of Zen, Zen training and meditation. So that's a, that's a very different set of knowledge acquisition conditions than what we had for the geology. Um, this one is a, a little more personal. Uh, if, if you have gone to the funeral of someone you've loved, then, then you have a very different apprehension of that person who's, who's now not alive in front of you. It's conditioned by your relationship with that person, with your lived experience of that person. And um, this uh, wonderful quote from William James talks about how uh, to, to know that matter could have had that form makes matter sacred ever after. Uh, that's a very different set of conditions of knowing than say, that of a forensic pathologist, for example, or a medical student in encountering the body of someone who's died, where they will be, their conditions of knowledge will be physiology, the fact that the metabolism is no longer working. And what, what they will see in essence in the mundane world is inert matter that's no longer alive and just turned back into the atoms from which it started. Whereas the experience of a loved one is, is a very different set of knowledge acquisition conditions, right? 
it's your lifetime with this person who um, who you're relating to even even after they've died. And for my last example, I brought the crystal back. Um, what are the knowledge conditions under which the diffraction pattern was acquired? Okay, I acquired that diffraction pattern myself. That's from my lab. And what was I thinking about when I did that? Uh, basically, the mathematics of crystal structures, the symmetries, the fact that the Fourier transform of the real space lattice is the reciprocal lattice, which we now see in this diffraction pattern. Uh, and uh, so this sort of arcane mathematical sense of what the crystal is, those were the conditions under which I was acquiring that knowledge when I, when I uh, made this diffraction pattern, not to mention the instrumentation and so on that, that was required. Um, and all of that was beautiful knowledge, exquisite knowledge, profound knowledge, but still, Pretty mundane knowledge. Okay, uh, there was nothing, uh, nothing sacred about it. Uh, although I enjoyed it, I, I considered it important. But now, if you are encountering an actual real crystal, uh, you may have a different sort of encounter with it, and the conditions under which you might encounter something in the real world. For this example. I chose uh, continental phenomenology, the uh, philosophical tradition of Husserl and Merleau-Ponty. Uh, this uh, person who, who wrote these lines, McCurdy, he's in that tradition, he's an existentialist philosopher. And, and what does he see when he encounters something? I, per I perceive the real uh, things emerge from, from it a real being has unsuspected meaning. Uh, it, it, it emerges sig significance beyond the meaning which I had in mind, releases hidden meaning. Those are all things that you, that, uh, you don't get from the sort of mundane world interaction I was having with my crystal when I took this diffraction pattern. I, I do have these sorts of things in my encounters with crystals, but not when I'm not when I'm doing science with them. So, so those are three simple examples to try to give you a flavor for what we mean by the different conditions under which knowledge is acquired and how they can lead to either a mundane world or a sacred world. Okay, let's go on to a uh, a bigger problem, and um, that problem will be the problem of origins. Okay, the beginning, the beginning of the cosmos creation, if you will. And in in a mundane telling of it, then uh, we would talk in terms of physical cosmology. So that is a cognitive empirical basis. And, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the details of that in the next slide. In contrast to the mundane physical cosmology world, um, in a sacred world, uh, your discussion of the origins would be in the form of a creation mythos, okay? And almost every culture uh, across the globe and across time has had some sort of a creation mythos. And its purpose it goes beyond the purposes of physical cosmology. Its purpose is to create meaning and to uh, give a sense of why the present order is as it is, not just about the past, but the present. And, um, and it's a characteristic of, of a sacred world. So let's do a little bit of... Um, analysis of these two cases, and then try to put them together a little bit. So for physical cosmology, uh, there are a set of empirical facts that, that we have. Uh, the starlight 
uh, is uh, red shifted starlight spectra. Uh, the uh, ratios of hydrogen helium in the early universe uh, are measured. Uh, the cosmic microwave background was discovered in the 1960s. And all of that disparate data can be combined into one coherent model along with the general relativity. And that coherent model is that the universe is expanding and cooling, okay? From that model, we can create a kind of narrative, an origin story, because if the universe is expanding and cooling, were you to go back in time, you would be going back into a contracting and heating universe, right? And as the universe contracted and got hotter and hotter as it contracted, well, eventually it will have to contract to a single point with a kind of infinite energy density, okay? That's what people call the initial singularity, uh, T equals zero. And, um, and so we can call that the origin of the universe. In essence, this is, uh, this is what passes for a creation myth in our modern mon mundane world. And well, let's move on and look at creation myths uh, more generally. And again, I wanna emphasize that a creation myth has to do a lot more than physical cosmology alone does for us. It has to create meaning, a sense of belonging in the world. And um, the other important point though, is the, uh, the fourth bullet point here. Things that are known in the physical world, empirical facts about the physical world do enter into a creation mythos typically. And um, uh, my little example down here at the bottom uh, illustrates that. So in a culture where there's a lot of red clay, uh, the first humans in that culture were created out of red clay in their creation mythos. Whereas in a culture where corn was required for the sustenance to keep, keep people from starving to death, uh, turned out cornmeal was what the first humans were made of in that culture. So, um, so these parts of the empirical environment do pass into the ingredients that make up the creation mythos. And one of the things I want to suggest is that uh, the empirical facts of the um, physical cosmology model are also physical facts that could be incorporated into a mythos. So this is how we're going to use complementarity. We're going to think about what's the possible mythic significance of, cos of physical cosmology. How can it do some of the jobs that creation myths have done, which we, they don't really work for us anymore because we do live in the mundane world a lot of the time. And we, we think physical cosmology is, is true, it's real, and it is. But how can we use that um, in a sacred world? So, these empirical constraints on myths that I was just talking about, um, we can use what we know of physical cosmology and attribute meaning to some of these things. Um, so in other words, the red clay was just red clay, but it had this sacred role that was given to it. Uh, it's still red clay in a mundane world. So things in, in physical cosmology can be given meaning and that's not necessarily prohibited, but we need to avoid blurring our categories. And that's, I think, where the complementarity comes in because we can ask ourselves, okay, what are the conditions under which this 
was apprehended or that was apprehended? And how can they be fit together in a way that doesn't make category er er errors? Okay. The other important thing is to note that um, the mundane world and the sacred world, they're both the same world, right? So complementarity is not a, a, a dualism, right? Complementarity says we live in one world, but we can apprehend it So, um, yeah, so so people haven't seen this yet. All right, so um, yeah, I was saying that um, some, some people have already done the kind of thing I was just talking about in the previous slide. Uh, and some examples are Brian Swim and Ursula Goodenow in their writings have done um, things like that. And, um, and uh, Paul Carr, a couple of months ago in this webinar series, also did something along, along those lines. But someone you probably <clears throat> haven't heard of is Alfred Globus, who uh, wrote a, uh, a very long book, which consisted of an amalgamation of, of, of straight astronomy and cosmology, just, just basic science mix, mixed together with his, his own religious insights that he developed over his lifetime and put it all, he, he put it into this system he called Veritism and wrote it up in this 400 page book, which is written in the style of the King James Bible. It, it's really an amazing uh, piece of work. And, um, one of the things I, I wanted to um, point out with with with, uh, with Globus is that he actually wrote for us what the conditions were under which he was acquiring his knowledge. So we have his own testament to this, and that's this uh, this quotation down here. This is uh, uh, what what Globus wrote. So I'll leave you to read that on your own. And. Um, the second example I wanted to give, in addition to, uh, to these, is um, uh, 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 something I, I noticed um, when, I was, when I was doing this and thinking about, well, okay, um, what, what can you attribute meaning to and, and what kind of meaning can you, can you attribute to it if it's just like a physical thing? And, and I noticed this um, congruence between the Emir motif and, and the nucleosynthesis of heavy elements. So uh, the Amir motif is one of those recurring themes in a lot of, a lot of um, creation myths. Amir was a, uh, a Norse god who basically got dismembered and parts of his body became geographical uh, parts of the geography. So you know, his blood became the ocean and his skull became a mountain and that kind of thing. So it just sounds like a kind of bloody, primitive story. But there's, a, a, again, myths have meaning, and the deep meaning of that is, is that sometimes there's a need for, for destruction in order to bring forth creation. And, and that's what made me think of the, uh, the nucleosynthesis of heavy elements, as you probably know. Uh, iron is the heaviest element that you can get in ordinary fusion reactions in stars. All of the rest of the elements above iron in the periodic table uh, have to be created in supernova explosions. And, um, and, and so in a supernova explosion, these new elements of the universe become created but the star has died in the process. It is no longer exists as, as what it was. So, um, so I was I was uh, very struck by that. Um, okay, we're almost at the end now. Uh, there are some some unresolved issues that I wanted to point out. Uh, many people are probably thinking. Uh, of these things themselves. Okay. 
And the first is that if it depends on our condition of knowing, then a, a person who was a strong proponent of scientific materialism could simply say, well, all of this sacred quality of nature you're talking about, it, it's just in your head. It's just you're projecting that onto nature. It's not a part of the properties of nature itself. So, so that is a question that one has to um, face. And uh, related to that is the uh, status of objectivity. Uh, if objectivity has a, a, a completely privileged status, then once again, uh, scientific materialism, which is much more based on objectivity, is, uh, is um, it's an argument uh, against what I've been saying, but against complementarity. So to do, um, to do an analysis of those issues, uh, it would take a long time, so I'm just gonna touch on them briefly, obviously. Uh, but I did want to uh, bring in Harold Hoofding, who is um, uh, Bohr's philosophical mentor and who was a very well-respected philosopher in his time. He died about 1930. And Hoofding really addressed a lot of the issues that I just kind of brought up in the previous slide. So just very, very briefly, the the, the, the root of Hoofding's philosophy is grounded in, in the idea of continuity and discontinuity. And what, what he says is that we, we create a kind of rational world out of the continuity in being, but, but that there's an inherent discontinuity there also. And as we build up this rational world, uh, the discontinuities eventually cause us to, to have to rethink everything and, and expand our, our horizons so that, uh, that that's why there's no final end to, to our search for knowledge and an insight that, um, that uh, when we come to a, what seems to be an end, then the discontinuities erupt and we have to keep going. So uh, I won't go into all of these specific things, except uh, I will say that, um, that uh, Hoofding demonstrates that because being is, in, is inexhaustible, objectivity, although it's important, uh, very, very important, is not unlimited, that there are limits to, to objectivity because of these discontinuities that erupt. And, um, and he also strongly urges us to um, think about the fact that, that our ontology is deeply rooted in our epistemology. They're joined together inextricably. And because of that, uh, my epistemological argument goes over into the, into the ontological question that we brought up in the previous slide. So, um, so that uh, just gives you a flavor for, for uh, how we deal with those issues. And on that note, I will thank everybody for their patience in, in listening to all this and leave you with um, a couple of nice quotations. One from Niels Bohr, and uh, one from Dave Carter, which is, was the, uh, the um, inspiration for the title of, of this book. And on that, I will pass things back to JD. Thank you, that was great. Very interesting. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to hearing Frank Schaefer's response. Uh, Frank Schaefer is a New York Times bestselling author of over a dozen fiction and nonfiction books, a religious reform activist, and a regular guest commentator on The Readout on MSNBC with Joy Reid. He's also a free, frequent guest of Rachel Maddow. His latest book, Fall in Love, Have Children, Stay Put, Save the Planet, Be Happy, 
Be Happy, that's the end of the title, emphasizes the importance of quality human relationships for a joy-filled life and the science that backs that up. His podcasts and video blog in conversation with Frank Schaefer, Love in Common, and It Has to Be Said, respectively, have garnered millions of streams and still counting, of course, from over 260,000 followers on various social media platforms and beyond. His website is at lovechildrenplanet.com. And it's my pleasure to introduce him. I first encountered Frank when um, he, we were both at the Wild Goose Festival down south and uh, encountered this book. And it, it just, it's meant a lot to me in my life. And so I'm um, anxious to hear what he has to say. And with that, I'll turn it over to Frank. Hello. We got you, you're on. All right, after all the technical glitches, I wanted to make sure we've got a little snowstorm up here first. Uh, first, JD, let me thank you for inviting me. And um, Dr. Derry, I, I was uh, awestruck and, and gob, gobstruck, as we used to say, um, by your presentation. I really loved it. Uh, I, I hope that some of this is in the book that JD talked about, so I can read it and go deeper into what you were saying. Um, I was struck by the Niels Bohr quote at the end there that we're both spectators as well as participants when it comes to existence. Um, having written five novels and maybe a dozen nonfiction books, most of them are, are biographical in the sense that they are memoirs looking at various parts of my escape from my evangelical fundamentalist past. Um, my own work is very rooted uh, with, with my biography in the sense that um, I see my writing as a reaction to my own experiences during a kind of a checkered uh, path. Um, J.D. held up a little copy of a book called Why I'm an Atheist Who Believes in God, and that's a good way to begin my um, comments here, um, because there's a story attached to that. When, when my uh, memoir, Crazy for God, came out, and um, people like Terry Gross on Fresh Air and others were interviewing me, and so it, it turned into a, a fairly widely read book. Um, the, the late um, uh, new atheist leader, a philosopher, writer, journalist, Christopher Hitchens, read the book and um, got hold of my number and, and email address and told me that he thought it was a great pity that when he got to the end of the book that I hadn't made a clear declaration that, as he put it, you joined our side. And by that, he meant that I had a kind of um, revelation and salvation experience, but in the opposite direction of the fundamentalism that I had been raised on. Uh, the book is about my journey out of that fundamentalist background and to a more liberal political and less certain view of spirituality. He thought it was a pity that I hadn't taken the last step. And interestingly enough, at about the same time, I was getting a, a fairly heavy email response. This is pretext. Uh, we still had landlines and, and email was a thing uh, in those days from a number of evangelical people that I had known. Um, who hadn't completely cut off contact with me after I left the fold, as it were, and turned against that position that I had been raised on. And they were saying, you know, we were so pleased that you have some spiritual elements left in your life when we got to the end of your memoir. Uh, what a shame it is that you haven't made a clear declaration that you're still a Christian. It, it occurred to me that if you changed a few words in Chris Hitchens' emails to me and later in our phone conversations, um, uh, and by the way, he liked the book, which is why he got in touch with me, um, that the response from my old evangelical friends who now regarded me as a backslidden heretic and, and secular enemy, I guess, if, if you went to the, the limit of their thinking, and Chris Hitchens were more or less identical. They were both calling for uh, what I view as a kind of a declaration of certainty. So one of the things I like about this idea of uh, that... that um, Dr. Derry was talking about um, of complementarity is that it sort of describes what I tried to offer in my book, Why I'm an Atheist Who Believes in God, in which I argue for the embrace of paradox. The difference between uh, Dr. Derry's um, talk today and the way I approach my work 
and this is not a criticism, it's just a difference, um, is that as a novelist, uh, and by the way, if you want to dig into my, my novels and works of humor, Portofino is the one to start with, the town in Italy, about a little boy traveling with his evangelical missionary family in the 50s and 60s, a kind of a coming of age story that's quite biographical um, and has had a lot of readers all over the world. It seems to strike a note with people. Um, but my point is that as a writer, as an artist, I guess you could say, and not as an academic by any stretch of the imagination, my own approach is always the story behind the story approach, this idea that we are spectators in our own stories, not just uh, comment commenting on them. So if I was trying to write a story about Dr. Derry's presentation today um, and, and a response to it, it, it would begin with the way I often interview people on my podcasts which is not to go where they want to go. Uh, so I, inter I have interviewed rock stars and actors, and I've interviewed uh, women who have become very famous in the, in, in, the, in the glass ceiling smashing business, and they're now running big corporations. And they expect my questions to always be about their career, about their credentials, about their achievements, about awards they've won. I tend to go at it the other way. I tell little stories first about myself. I say, hey, look, you know, um, I got my girlfriend pregnant when we were 17 and 18. We've been married 53 years. If you ask me who I am today, I'm not a writer. I'm not a novelist. I'm not someone that has been on TV or whatever, as, as JD was introducing me. I'm Nora's grandfather. She's my youngest grandchild. In 10 minutes, I'll be picking her up from school. Um, I'm going to cook for her. We're going to sit down. I'm reading her a book right now called The Hidden Life of Dogs by Elizabeth Marshall Thomas. She's really into the book. That's who I am. Who are you? And they get it. Uh, it kind of cuts through the, the, the idea that somehow our ideas uh, and the motivation for expressing them can be isolated from who we are. So my my questions for uh, JD and for Gregory would not be along the lines of first addressing their formal presentation of ideas. It would be why uh, in Dr. Derry's background in psychology and spirituality and who his mother was or father or how he grew up or what he stuck with in terms of that program or moved away from, has he been motivated to try to put together a view of the world which gives him room for both spirituality and science. That would be the story I would be most interested in. As far as the presentation goes, that in no way negates my interest in what he was presenting. But my own view of both spirituality and science is this, and that is when it comes to epistemology, the problem from, from my point of view of the study of epistemology or science or religion or spirituality or history or archeology span or anthropology or anything else. And that I face as an artist who writes for a living and has managed to earn his living reading, writing books, including fiction, is that the limitation of words is so severe that I find as a writer that the very act of describing something in a way destroys it. It fixes it in a time and place Someone will ask me 10 years later, what did you mean by such and such a statement? And I, my answer to them when it's a nonfiction type of, of proclamation is, look, that was a snapshot of where I was when I wrote that morning. It may not be where I am today. Um, it isn't that I'm constantly changing my mind, but this is a journey. And so for me, uh, my, my response, I guess, is this, and that is, what is the human need that, that, that precludes the issues themselves and, and throws them into a shadow, whatever the science or the physics or the epistemology or the apologetic arguments that people like my father used to make, what is behind what's going on, point one. Point two, the limitation of words as a writer to me means that, for instance, I have a, a, an understanding of the fact that the only weapons we have in this war to declare ourselves, whether as artists or as scientists talking about uh, complementarity or whatever it may be, is these little sounds we're making with our mouths or the typing we do or the words we write down, but that these words that we use to describe things are not the things themselves. The things themselves we are describing are oblivious to our description of them. 
So we can declare a planet or a star or a moon to be a planet and then debunk it and say it's no longer a planet, it's just something else. It doesn't know that it has either been turned into a planet in our, in our words, uh, it has been demoted now and is something else. And I find that um, is, is true about all these things. Lastly, I would say my, my interest in this, I guess, runs into the fact that um, I have a dog right now, Zip, who I'm very fond of, a kind of a guardian angel who helps me sleep at night, a little mixture of Dachshund and, 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 and a couple other little mutt mixes, little Jack Russell Terrier in there. I often feel that Zip and I are communicating without words. He has a very strong emotional intuition. He knows when I'm up, when I'm down, he knows what I need. Um, I don't know uh, how Zip thinks because I don't know if he has any comparable type of verbalization. How does, he, how does he put ideas together and yet intuitively, how does he react? I wish we could get with JD uh, and, and Dr. Derry talking about these things in terms of putting science and spirituality together to, a, to two different levels, and I'll end here. One would be to find out what motivates Dr. Derry, and I'm kind of asking this as a question. I had an evangelical mother. I'm still wrestling with this stuff. I'm writing memoirs about why I left one point of view, but I cling to a sense of spirituality. I get up in the morning and pray for my five grandchildren and my three grown children, and I cannot help myself, even though in terms of my background, I no longer believe that a God is hearing those prayers. And yet I do that because I have a certain need. I would be interested in cutting through the boilerplate, as it were, um, and, and getting, if I was talking with Dr. Derry and we're sitting on an airplane together, having a discussion or a drink somewhere, it would be okay. So, you know, what got you into this in the beginning? Not just the science, but this need to even look at these issues. And I would say the same thing to JD. Um, I find in my own writing and an exploration of my life that that's what it keeps coming back to, the kind of pre-philosophy, pre-epistemology, pre-statement motivation to me interests me more as a writer than the actual statement of quote-unquote fact, which is just a snapshot of where that human being is right this, this afternoon, this evening. And then two, I would really like a discussion that's with a Dr. Lot. Perry about um, about his own view of the limitation of description and the difference between the description, be that scientific or uh, in terms of spirituality. And I think that's where both science and spirituality do have a sort of complementary sense. And that is both have to use words to describe something that is actually beyond the ability of the word to capture and it is just a human snapshot of something. It is not the thing itself. And I think that's a point that in a way is where I'd like to finish my comments because I see very clearly that that's the limitation of both art, science, religion, and indeed all human endeavor. We're scratching around with our vocabulary, yet the vocabulary is describing something that we do not, uh, you know, we are not defining because it is what it is with or without us. And I think that's the most interesting discussion. What is that out there with or without us, with or without our description, with or without our cleverness, with or without the framework we're trying to give it? And when I talked with Chris Hitchens about my book, Why I'm an Atheist Who Believes in God, that's where we got into discussion. And interestingly enough, Chris kind of got what I was saying. And he said, I see your point. Um, sadly, he got very ill soon after that and passed away. I would have loved to have sat down and had this discussion with him and just find out, A, Chris, what motivates you? And B, in other words, where do you come from? Who are you? Not your career stuff, the equivalent of cooking for my grandchild Nora for every afternoon. That's who you really are. So let's cut the crap and get to that. And secondly, don't you agree that the words you're describing to make your new atheist argument fall short of describing reality? That's not an accusation because I find as a writer, my words always fall short. So thank you very much. Uh, JD, thank you, uh, Gregory Derry, for a wonderful presentation and an opportunity to be part of this. Wow, so good. Um, we lost Dr. Derry for part of that time. Um, so actually, Frank, I'm going to ask you to stay on because even though we're not on an airplane, you can have that discussion. <laughs> we're all here now. And um, Dr. Derry didn't hear some of the first part of your response. 
So um, just talk and uh, that'll give me time to look at the questions. <laughs> okay, well, hey, uh, uh, Dr. Derry, first of all, thank you so much. And again, I don't know if you heard me effusing about how wonderful I thought your presentation was. I hope you did. And then I don't know what you picked up or didn't pick up on. I, I missed a few minutes in the middle, so I, I didn't hear all, all. I heard the beginning and I didn't hear the end, which is where you put a question to me. So, yeah, so I, I will. Well, uh, I, I, get, I put it in a nutshell. My, my question as a writer was I find the limitations of words to describe what I'm trying to describe as a writer are such that I've come to the conclusion for myself that in a way something dies the moment I describe it because I know that the thing itself doesn't know it's been described. And I think that applies to science or notions of divinity or anything else, that whole human limitation of, of description. And so I just wanted to ask you, A, you know, what's your equivalent of cooking for a grandchild in the afternoon? Who are you really besides your qualifications? I'm always interested in that as a, as a <laughs> podcaster. Um, you, and then on the other hand, besides that sort of very basic, where does your impulse to even look at these things come from? You know, I had a fundamentalist Christian missionary mother. That's why I'm still interested in all this, mm -hmm. uh, because I've spent a whole life trying to unpack that. That's me. Mm -hmm. Who are you? That's one question. And then the other question for you is, don't you feel that this idea of, of uh, complementarity in a way its biggest plus is that it acknowledges the limitation of words to describe things, both whether it's in the field of science or spirituality, both come up short. And in that sense, the opposites really do complement each other. They, they both can be true um, in, in, in that neither set of descriptions actually is more than words about something other than what those words are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll take the second one first, uh, because um, although I uh, agree with you, I think there's one nuance I would add, which is that um, <clears throat> science is a little bit different than than um, than religious revelation in the sense that in science you 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 are striving to make things as clear as possible for somebody else to understand what you understand. And and you can actually succeed to to a certain extent that way, whereas I, I think uh, a religious experience is almost impossible to convey to somebody else. You, you you just have to experience it and hope they've had an experience similar to yours to know what you've had. So I think there's like a a, a difference between them in that sense, but. I think your point is it's 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 a it's a difference of degree rather than a total difference in kind, because yeah, I, you know I guess what I'm trying to say is the crystal you're describing doesn't know it's been described and it doesn't know it's a crystal, and and all I'm talking about as a writer is that it seems to me the language of science or literature or religion is all the same because the language itself falls short because it's not the thing itself. It's always it's always a description, it's secondhand. It's like Christians who quote the Bible and say, Jesus said, and sometimes I'll correct them and say, no, Jesus did not say, someone else wrote down what they say Jesus said. It's two steps removed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think the same for when we come to any kind of descriptions, it isn't the thing itself. We haven't captured the thing just because we described it or mm -hmm. used words to describe it. That's what true, I'm trying to True. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, your your other 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 thing about about uh, biographical um, things, I, I I usually don't talk about those things, and and it's um I mean partly because I'm extraordinarily pedantic, you know, <laughs> I do tend to to put things that are removed, but uh, uh, your 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 comment did 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 make a free association with me. The, the, the people in my sangha are always urging me to speak from the heart. And mm -hmm. what I have to tell them is, yes, yes, but my heart and my brain are very connected to each other. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, uh, I, I really do have a, I, I do really, I'm fascinated by ideas and, and get caught up in them. But, but I think you're right. I mean, the, these actual real experiences you know, I mean, I've got, I've only got one grandchild, but it was like an amazing experience to become a grandfather, and um, and so you know, you know, those are are the things that that um, are existentially important to us, and 
in our lives. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think they're also the things that sort of make sense of whatever we're saying in that speaking for myself, you know, as a writer or someone participating even with you now in this discussion, you know, you have this vague hope somewhere that by doing this, you're somehow protecting the future for people you really love who are younger than you. Mm -hmm. Because you want certain things to be known, you want the world to be a better place, it's worth talking about things, you know, in that sense, that's for me a motivation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Talking and, and doing to make a world a better place. Yeah. 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 Um, as far as how I came to where I am now, that, that's a long and winding tale. Um, very different than, than, your, than your life course. Uh, I was brought up in a, a, a Catholic family and was baptized, but, but despite the years of, of religious education in, 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 in New York, where I grew up the, in the public schools, you, you, you left for an hour or two for religious instruction. I don't know how they managed to do that constitutionally, but that was, but that was the system. Um, and I, uh, years and years of that, um, they, they, it didn't take with me. And when I, by the time I was a teenager, I basically would have called myself an atheist at that point. But in my twenties, I really broadened my horizons a lot, and for all sorts of reasons that are too many to even talk about but but that was that was when i started down what i would regard as a spiritual path that that that, uh, that i'm on now and again because i'm a, a a big fan of the unity of knowledge right which may be impossible but that's okay you strive for it anyway and and so um that was why eventually uh, I, um, I decided, I, I'd all, for decades had an interest in the relationship of science to spiritual things and, and how they mesh together. And, um, and then at some point I decided to um, try to make an intellectual contribution to those debates. And that was what eventually led to this book. And is the book, uh, is the talk you gave today, Forgive My Ignorance, uh, the, the sort of spine of the book? Is it is that what this new book that we learned about is? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, um, the, the, the book that was at the, the, the last slide I had. The, yes. The, the Only Sacred Ground. Yeah, yeah. that, that um, the uh, main point of that book is is a uh, a, a version of this talk with a lot more detail. <laughs> yeah, well, I loved the talk. I just can't thank you enough. It was wonderful. I, you know, I kind of forgot that I was supposed to be saying something at the end of it, which is a very good sign. <laughs> I was lost in the actual content. And it was like, oh, crap, I'm making some notes here. I'm supposed to come up with something here. And of course, I hadn't read it before or the opportunity to read the book, but I will get the book and read it with great interest. So thank you. Well, this oh, is yeah. such a great discussion. I'm I'm really loath to interrupt it. And uh, we are getting a little short on time now. Um, <clears throat> most of the questions that people have posted in the Q&A have been addressed by one or the other of you or your conversation together. I want to just pull out one or two um, <clears throat> that maybe you want to say more about. Uh, an anonymous person writes, my thinking is founded on Georgia O'Keeffe's assertion that nothing is less real than realism. Details are confusing. It's only by selection, <clears throat> by emphasis, that we get real meaning of things. And then this person asks, complementarity perhaps is the activity which attempts to get at O'Keefe's realism. Any thoughts on that? Wow, that's fascinating. Um, I, I would have to think about that one a while. There's a lot packed in there. That, that's a very interesting yeah. comment. And then from my point of view, I like, her, you know, I like her painting a lot. And I think, you know, when you're talking about something in terms of spirituality and and this this, uh, you know, what's normally seen in opposition to science, I think O'Keefe is an interesting person because between her sort of vagina like paintings and then her flowers, she was, you know, she is herself a transit a figure that that sort of 
uh, can be seen from two points of view. You know, she's very interested in in the philosophy of womanhood and the science, as you like, if you like, of nature. And at the same time, I don't think anyone looks at her work without giving it an, a spiritual interpretation. So she's an interesting person to bring up. And, and thank you, whoever asked that question. The first question of the evening, is it reasonable to assume that the term sacred has the same meaning for all who use it? If there's a range of meanings, does it serve any purpose in these kinds of discussions? Um, I, I would, I would doubt if every person has the exact same uh, view on it. But uh, again, what 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 I thought and in, 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 in said was that uh, there's there's enough enough overlap amongst people who have written on it that that you can you can make a a, a coherent um, definition of it, uh, not definition, but a coherent sense of what it is. Um, like uh, Aldous Huxley's book, The Perennial Philosophy. He, he, he's written an entire book that consists nothing of nothing but scriptural passages showing the, con the uh, um, uh, consilience of all these different, different world religions in, in what they mean by the sacred. So so, uh, so, yeah, I, 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 I think I, I understand what the person is saying that that there are severe limitations to mm -hmm. using words like that. But I think as uh, words are all we have, so mm -hmm. so I think you know you just have to use them as best you can. Uh, I'd be interested in what Frank thought about that, actually. Yeah, I mean, my I, I agree with you completely, and I would just go one step further. And of course, the same could be said of science itself because that is you know you, there is no such thing as science without the words describing it and so the same problem of definitions and pinning it down and types of science and one thing that interests me that I'd like your opinion on uh Dr. Derry is it it seems to me you know when I got, grew up in the 60s my dad was arguing that we were going into a secular period of history and he you know saw Christianity in opposition to this and his whole apologetic argument was made to sort of try to bring people back into the fold Ironically, we're in a very we're in a very religious and spiritual point of history, and I keep running into people who, of course, aren't going to church and they don't believe in God in the sense I grew up doing. But you know, speaking of crystals and all the rest of it, you know, there's so much stuff around. Um, we certainly have not become secular, and I would just like your opinion on how that has happened because it's not the way mid twentieth century people thought it was going to turn out. Yeah, it's turned out to be something I don't think any of us could have predicted. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, there's an interesting book, actually. A, a sociologist did a, a study of this. Um, uh, I think the name of his book was Spiritual Marketplace or something like that. Um, and he, um, yeah, he he kind of put people into four or five categories. Um, depending on on their religious attitudes and i can't remember what what his general conclusions were other than the fact that that i mean what struck me was that there was so much heterogeneity mm -hmm. and and i i guess that's about the best thing i can say about our present cultural moment in terms of religious views that that there is heterogeneity that we don't all have to believe some one single orthodoxy well, that, I hate to stop this, but I have to. <laughs> we are out of time. So thank you very much to both of you. I, I hope at some point maybe we can continue this conversation. But for not, tonight, I'm going to have to turn it back over to our host, Maynard, to uh, take us out. Again, thank you to, to all the questioners and the, um, both of the presenters tonight. Yeah, thanks to both of you. Yep. Well, thank you. Wonderful, wonderful time. Thank you.